After becoming Prime Minister of Ghana in 1957, and Africa's first post-colonial head of state, Kwame Nkrumah quickly became accustomed to a life of perpetual praise. Every day the press extolled his intellectual brilliance and integrity. An official portrait published in 1961 declared, to millions of people living both inside and outside the continent of Africa, Kwame Nkrumah is Africa and Africa is Kwame Nkrumah. When the question was asked, what is going to happen in Africa? It is to one that everyone looks for the answer, Kwame Nkrumah. As part of his personality cult, Nkrumah assumed grand titles. Man of Destiny, Star of Africa, his high dedication and the most famous of all, Osakifo, which meant victor in war. It was also more commonly translated as Redeemer. His presence became ubiquitous within Ghana. His profile was embellished on coins, banknotes and postage stamps. His statue stood outside Parliament. His name even appeared in neon lights. His birthday became a public holiday, and framed photographs of him adorned offices and shops. Beyond the facade, Nkrumah remained lonely and isolated. He became so immersed in his own isolation that he withdrew from most people. He chose to only surround himself with people who told him what he wanted to hear, thus bolstering his sense of superiority. His attempt at marriage proved futile. He arranged with President Nasser of Egypt to obtain an Egyptian bride. He never met this woman until the wedding day. His wife, Fadia Rizk only spoke Arabic and a little French, so communication between the two was strained from the get-go. The marriage produced three children, but years later in a letter Nkrumah wrote to his secretary Erica Powell, telling her that he married not for himself but rather for the presidency. From his lonely perch, Nkrumah built himself a citadel of power. A new constitution in 1960 established Ghana as a republic, this enabled him to rule by decree. He pursued critics relentlessly, using the Preventative Detention Act and other security measures at will. In 1961 it became a criminal offense for anyone to show disrespect to the head of state. Nkrumah also established a vast apparatus of control through the Convention People's Party. The party was also increasingly becoming more and more corrupt. Cabinet ministers routinely took 10% from all government contracts. And the granting of import licenses also involved skullduggery. Government funds were squandered every which way. A typical example was that of the Guinea Press, a company owned by Nkrumah which received more than £1.8 million from government sources. In 1961, Nkrumah promised to tackle government corruption. He denounced party members who combined their political career with business interests. And he lambasted ministers who flaunted their wealth. Despite the challenges facing his administration, Nkrumah did take impressive steps to turn Ghana into an industrial society. Hospitals, schools and roads were built at an unprecedented rate. A hydroelectric power plant was constructed on the Volta River. With these grand ambitions came grandeur, and projects were often undertaken for the mere prestige they offered. An example of this was Nkrumah's desire to build the largest dry dock in Africa. Once completed it was hardly used. Once one of Nkrumah's advisors walked into his office to find a European salesman peddling some far-fetched scheme. Before Nkrumah could sign the contract, the aide offered to read over the contract. He ended up saving the state budget $1 million. On a state visit to the Soviet Union, China, and other communist countries in 1961, Nkrumah returned convinced the answer to large-scale industrialization was via state-owned enterprises. As a result, a number of new state corporations were launched. The Ghana National Construction Corporation, the State Steelworks, the State Fiber Bag Corporation, and the Ghana Fishing Corporation. By 1966, there were more than 50 state enterprises. Meanwhile, the government's external debt soared. By 1963, it was at £184 million, and a year later it stood at £349 million. Short of foreign funds, Nkrumah increasingly resorted to using suppliers' credits. Faced with mounting financial difficulties, 
The government turned to imposing import controls, but they administered them in such random fashion that financial chaos ensued. Steadily the communist-style industrialization program, staffed by corrupt and incompetent managers, became hampered by a shortage of raw materials and spare parts and eventually ground to a halt. Nkrumah's agricultural policies were equally disastrous. He favored mechanized state farms and diverted huge government resources for their benefit, much to the peril of peasant farmers. As a result, payments to regular cocoa producers started to decrease, forcing peasant farmers to sell their cocoa to neighboring states. Over a 15-year period from 1965, cocoa production halved. Meanwhile, the mechanized state farms, largely run by party members and their cronies made huge losses, producing yields that were 20% of the peasant farmers. Nkrumah's handling of Ghana's economy had become calamitous, and by 1965 the state had become virtually bankrupt. When the finance minister announced at a cabinet meeting that Ghana's foreign reserves stood at less than 500 million pounds, Nkrumah was so shocked that he sat in silence for 15 minutes, thereafter breaking down and weeping. Nkrumah's aspirations of foreign prominence fared no better. His attempts to unionize Africa were given short shrift. In response to this Nkrumah chose to attack those who did not support these ambitions, including Julius Nyerere of Tanzania. In a similar fashion he accused Francophone states in West Africa of acting as puppets of French colonialism. In the wider field of foreign affairs, he strove tirelessly to act as a world statesman, offering his services to act as a mediator in international crises. In support of these ambitions he built a vast global network of embassies, Unfortunately, this achieved little other than to enrich the party members who staffed them. After an assassination attempt was made on him in 1962, he suspected those around him were involved and ordered the arrest of three cabinet ministers. Another assassination attempt was made on him in 1964 by a police constable, prompting Nkrumah to disarm the police and sack several officers. By 1964 Nkrumah had turned Ghana into a one-party state. In practical terms this made little difference. All opposition had been silenced long before. The crowning folly of Nkrumah's regime was Job 600 which was the construction of a grand complex of buildings for a single conference of OAU heads of state in 1965. It cost £10 million and was launched at a time when factories were starved of raw materials, there were queues outside shops for food and hospitals were short of drugs. Nkrumah boasted of the grandeur of the project. Sixty self-contained suites that would have satisfied the demands of millionaires, a banqueting hall capable of seating 2,000 guests and fountains operated by 72 jets with multicolored lights. The conference was an abject failure, mainly because Nkrumah's foreign policy had alienated so many governments. Many state leaders were reluctant to attend and there was even a boycott led by the Ivory Coast. Nkrumah's downfall came two months later when he chose to interfere with the military. His attempts to subordinate the army to his own purposes, as he had done with so many other organs of the state, caused deep and dangerous resentment. There was particular anger over the favorable treatment accorded to the president's own guard regiment, an elite unit regarded as Nkrumah's private army. On 24 February 1966, while Nkrumah was vainly attempting to mediate in the Vietnam War, he was overthrown by the army in a CIA-backed coup d'etat. On the streets of Accra and Kumasi, large crowds gathered to welcome the soldiers. Outside Parliament Nkrumah's statue was torn down and smashed to pieces. Marching through the streets of Accra, youth group members who had been trained on such slogans as Nkrumah never dies and Nkrumah is the new messiah carried placards proclaiming Nkrumah is not our messiah. In his book Dark Days in Ghana, which was published in 1968, Nkrumah asserted that the CIA were behind his removal as president. He wrote, it has been one of the tasks of the CIA and other similar organizations to discover potential quislings and traitors in our midst, and to encourage them, by bribery and the promise of political power, to destroy the constitutional government of their countries. Nkrumah's detractors dismissed his claims in dark days in Ghana, 
as delusional and an excuse for his mismanagement of the country through his dictatorial leadership. But in 1999, Nkrumah's claim was borne out when the US government declassified the Western orchestrated plot to get rid of the man who was doing more to undermine our interests than any other black African.